Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mike Tippetts, and I am privileged to be the moderator for today's presentation uh, on SD-WAN. We're very, very excited to have you join us. Uh, we're looking forward to the information that will be shared. We're excited to have you here. We're utilizing um, a WebEx meeting um, session that uh, gives us a little, little more flexibility as participants uh, than your typical webinar software, so we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, we ask you to hold your questions until we get to the end. Uh, we'll open up the chat window, let people type in their questions or um, raise their hands and, and we'll call on them. But we want to hang on to those questions until we get to the end. We have quite a bit of material that we want to get through first. Um, we'll attempt to address everyone's questions before we wrap up. Um, if you happen to be listening to this as a recording after the fact, please feel free to email us at uh, info at hughes.com with any questions you have during the recording. I'm privileged today to be joined by Kevin Tolley, who is the founder and CEO of the Tolley Group. Kevin, uh, Kevin has been a, a long time um, inter interacting with Hughes and a, a uh, consultant with us and someone that we've worked with closely and we're very, very uh, excited to have him joining us here today as one of the presenters. We also have Bill Romancek, who is a senior director focusing on connecting the distributed enterprises and SD-WANs in specific. And he and Kevin will be interacting and sharing the presentation window with us here through the balance of our presentation. And before I turn it over to Kevin and Bill, I just want to let you know we're, we've got a good agenda today. We're going to be talking about application assurance. Um, again, as many of us are moving to the cloud and moving our application sources to different places outside of our main um, operating um, locations, being assured that our users can get to that application is critical. We'll also be discussing the challenges presented by broadband. It is a very affordable and a great way to come off of MPLS, but of course it is not without its challenges. We're going to discuss those, and then we're going to be talking about SD-WAN and how using some functionality, some quality of service that is typically part of an SD-WAN solution will be able to uh, avoid many of those broadband challenges. We'll wrap up by talking about a particular case study on SD-WAN, and then we'll open it up uh, for Q&A. Again, we ask you to hold on to those questions until we get to the end. Um, if you haven't, please go ahead and just mute your, your phone or your, uh, your headset device. With that, um, I'd like to go ahead and start the presentation with Kevin. And Kevin, I'd like to uh, say welcome and uh, let you take over. Okay, great, Mike. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me today. We're on all together here on the objective. So you've uh, given us a good idea, teeing it up. There's a lot of uh, you know a lot of material to go through. So let me let me get started here, and then Bill and I will go back and forth as the uh, as the hour progresses. So so as, as you said, SD WAN provides enormous benefits to users. In particular, SD WAN solutions allow network architects to leverage cost effective broadband links, as you noted. Those broadband links, however, do not always provide the reliability or performance char characteristics of traditional links. So it is the quality of service or QoS component of the SD-WAN that implements the intelligence and features to provide a reliable and high performance using user experience using underlying resources that might be subject to performance issues. So, as a network specialist, you must not only be aware of the importance of QoS, you must have some knowledge to know how to illustrate and prove its behavior in your environment. At the Tolly Group, we've been specializing in evaluating IT for 30 years. We've put together a vendor-neutral guide to help you evaluate QoS in your SD-WAN. So our SD-WAN Benchmarking Best Practices Guide for QoS will be made available to all webinar attendees and will be the focus of my commentary today. So let's start by taking a look at an overall framework for QoS and, and application assurance. Bill, do you want to take over? Kevin had mentioned uh, it's all about, and you saw in a prior slide, just the end user experience, the customer experience. In some cases, that might be your employees. A lot of times, that might be somebody at the branch location, a shopper, if you will, for example, in retail. 
And what you need and what you want from this SD-WAN technology is essentially an application assurance. A quick analogy for it would be when you enter a room and you turn on the light switch, you just expect the lights to work. It's something that, you know, it's, a, it's an oddity. It's a very rare occurrence and that doesn't happen. You turn the lights on and off using the switch. Uh, phones would be very similar. You pick it up, you get a dial tone, you make a call. For the SD-WAN technology we're going to be talking about today in the QoS, it's to provide this application assurance for the applications that are running on the network. And not all applications are equal, meaning that some of them are customer facing, they have more importance than others. So where you have a VoIP call, where you have a video call, where maybe there's a POS transaction, you want for those to have a great application assurance across the network and you might not care as much about a bulk transaction, email in the background, or like a Dropbox update. So you have to take these applications, which quite honestly seem to be growing almost exponentially on the network today as people are adding in loyalty and security and training and all these different apps. You need a way to identify them. Once you do, you then classify them into like this importance level. And then once you get the classification done, and what we're going to talk about is how you apply this quality of service, this prioritization, it ends up giving you this good user experience where hopefully it's a thumbs up and um, the applications just work and you don't have things like uh, congestion and degradation, these other bad experiences that would lead to a negative end user experience. So with that, I guess, Kevin, let me hand it back to you for a moment just to talk a little bit about SD-WAN and the marketplace in general. Okay, sure. Uh, thanks. And as we look at it, really, when you look at the marketplace, the real question is, you know, it really, is the technology as good as the marketing, right? That is ultimately the question that we have to ask ourselves when we encounter an impressively marketed SD-WAN solution. So in, in my view, evaluation is essential, period. Makes no difference whether you're deploying the solution yourself or getting it from a managed services provider. You know, while broadband, as we've noted, enhances the economic attraction of SD-WAN, it also adds to the complexity, right? The broadband is dynamic, and dynamic is not always a good thing. The actual bandwidth capacity can change during the day, can go up, can go down, along with important characteristics of the link, such as packet loss, delay, and jitter. So you have to be certain that your SD-WAN solution will respond appropriately to these changes. Bill? Yeah, you're, you're spot on there, and as people deploy broadband, there are so many different flavors of it for cable, fiber, you know, still some legacy DSL, cellular, each with different speeds. And uh, some data is shown in the graphs here. The top right graph is about 90 days worth of data to a casual dining restaurant location. And the circuit that we're um, depicting here was a 16 by 2 cable circuit. So this was a 16 meg down, 2 megabits up. And that's sort of represented by the dashed orange line that you see on the graph. Uh, what we're able to track through the SD-WAN technology that was deployed here was the actual capacity or bandwidth offered by the cable provider. And what you can see by the solid blue and solid purple line was that actually the broadband in this case, it was a positive. Uh, it was offering in general more bandwidth than what it was provisioned at. So you were seeing normally 22 megs, let's say down into the restaurant. But as Kevin points out, it's a dynamic environment. The capacity could change among other characteristics. And sometime in March, it actually dropped down to almost eight megabits per second for a time. And this might have been, you know, a last mile issue, something at the CO, or something in the internet itself, and then the service returned. And you need, when you do the evaluation of the SD-WAN technology, to test these types of conditions where the capacity changes. On the bottom uh, is an example from a network, again, that's deployed. Uh, this is a broadband network that has over 1,000 locations. And what we were looking at here in, is the, did are brownouts. And we'll define a brownout as a degradation in the link, um, you know, packet loss, increased latency, jitter, something of that nature that would cause a degraded performance for nominally four seconds. And we looked at unique sites over just a little over a three-week period, and on average for this 1,000-site network, there were 17% of the locations suffered a brownout. Some might have had more than one, but it was just at least they had a four-second impairment of the link. And while you think four seconds may not be a long time, if you are watching a video call or you're part of a Skype and you lose four seconds of video and it freezes, 
or even on this webinar now, if my audio disappears for four seconds mid-sentence, uh, you note that. And if you're a pharmacist talking with a customer or a financial planner on a VoIP call, four seconds can be an eternity. So that's something that as we go through here for the QoS technologies, you need to be able to account for and certainly show that uh, the technology can mitigate it. I guess if I can hand it back over to you, Kevin, just to touch upon the different QoS technologies we'll be discussing. Sure, I got it. I've got the I think the next two slides here, so I'll be taking the mic for a couple minutes here. So let's take a look at the the QoS technologies that provide App Assurance. So QoS is an umbrella term that covers three distinct areas, as we show on our slide here. And let me go through them briefly. First and foremost is bandwidth management or traffic shaping, two names for the same thing. You know, here's the essence of QoS: taking the bandwidth available on a single link and allocating it across multiple applications and users that in all pro probability are demanding more bandwidth than is available. So, as, And as Bill said, not all applications have the same requirements, so you need to do this. There are some that are just inherently more important and some that are inherently less important than others. So traffic shaping is both the first and last resort. If there are no backup links available, it is traffic shaping that provides control over allocating precious bandwidth to conform to the priorities that you have configured, right, business priorities. So path control is that element that manages the distribution of your traffic and sessions across multiple wide area network links. So this is not just simply providing rerouting to a secondary link in the case of a primary link failure. It also involves capabilities of migrating, session, or migrating sessions selectively should conditions on the original link degrade to unacceptable levels. And we'll obviously go into more detail here. Finally, we have forward error correction, or FEC. This is also known as replication. So here, session quality is maintained by sending additional duplicate copies of packets out across the network. The idea being that in the face of packet loss, the sending of duplicate packets will reduce the chances of a given uh, packet loss for a given uh, session. So again, we'll delve further into this in the presentation. And let's go to the next slide. Bill, would you mind advancing for me? So let's go to some of the, the kind of nitty-gritty of, of, of how you benchmark this, because this is one of the themes of today's uh, discussion. So as noted, our goals today are to identify important elements of SD-WAN QoS that should be evaluated and provide guidance on how you, how you can evaluate these elements for your environment. So this slide is taken from our Tolly Benchmarking Best Practices Guide for QoS. It's the only visual that I will use from that document, but let it serve as a reminder to use our document as a testing resource. So for now, it serves as a quick illustration of the components needed to evaluate the QoS of an SD-WAN solution. While there are many good commercial-grade test tools available, it is important to understand that you can certainly do basic but effective benchmarking using, using open source tools and a few PCs. So if you look here, uh, we just would need a pair of PCs running through an SD-WAN solution. The SD-WAN is paired also. Uh, you can use an open source network emulator to simulate the cloud. One caveat here is typically those open source emulators will only simulate a single link. And as you'll hear as we go through this, uh, learning about multi-link capabilities is very important. But certainly, you know, having that NetM environment is uh, better than nothing. And once you build this environment, you can run apps uh, over it to stress the link and configure your SD-WAN to run the priorities that you need. And it's very surprising to find out how much you can find out about a solution, even with very basic testing, just overloading a link, putting some priorities, going into the GUI, seeing what you can do, and see what comes out. So but be before you can prioritize traffic, the solution needs to be able to classify traffic. And let me hand things back over to Bill to start talking a little bit about classification. Bill? Yeah, Kevin, thank you. And uh, yeah, when you were talking about just fairly easy to figure things out, I agree there. And uh, just for the rest of the audience, we were talking offline a little bit ago, and I call it the sniff test, where I'm not necessarily a culinary expert, but at times you can just, you know, smell something or sniff something yep. and say that just isn't operating right or that doesn't seem to be going well. On the converse side, there's other things that you might sniff and your mouth starts to water and you go, this is mm -hmm. this is hitting my sweet spot. So, you know, with your 
paper, those are things that you would be able to discern fairly quickly. On the, the classification, uh, legacy networks, you know, using MPLS, let's say, as an example, going back for those that are familiar with that, you had different markings on packets that would help set priorities across the network. So all the routers and everything within the network from the branch locations back to the head end or where the packets were flowing would be prioritized based upon these DSCP or these class of service or types of service bits, high priority, low priority. You maybe did prioritization and classification based upon what VLANs they were coming from and going to or the, the IP addressing of the locations. When you look at today's networks and the applications, however, so many things are cloud-centric. Um, you know, you've got all of your Office 365 maybe out there, your Salesforce, you know, Dropbox, you've got um, different flows of traffic now from the branch directly to the internet as well as from the branch back to a corporate location. Uh, modern network techniques that are used by these different SD-WAN providers and technologies uh, they do it a couple of different ways. There's this DPI or deep packet inspection where you may actually look into the packet and say, oh, oh, this is a Citrix session or, hey, this is YouTube, and then assign a priority or a classification based upon that. Uh, you've got signatures and domains that would maybe say this is going to a third-party loyalty domain. Uh, just as an example, let's say it's Hughes.com. So I want that to have a higher priority than maybe someone at guest Wi-Fi going to Netflix or YouTube. So you may, you know, uh, classify applications that way. And the last one, the session behavior and also flow heuristics would just look at like cars on a highway, if you will. If I see a ambulance or I see a police car with the lights, I don't have to know what's inside that packet. I just know it's an important packet and you'd move it over to the left lane and let it go down the highway at speed so you give it priority versus maybe a large caravan of tractor trailers that are just moving freight that would move over towards the right side and you know, be a little bit slower down the road. And so these session behaviors look at the length of the sessions, the size of the packets, the frequency, are they changing sides, uh, sorry, sizes. And with that, assign it's a more of an interactive app, let's say like a credit transaction. It might be a real-time app like VoIP, or in some cases, it's just a background bulk transfer. It looks like they're doing some sort of a software download, if you will. So you identify the applications, certainly what's important to you. You then classify them. And with the identification and classification, that starts to lead us into this ultimate prioritization and the quality of service. So the first one we had outlined, and to hand it back to Kevin, we'll talk about traffic shaping. Okay. Thanks, Bill. All right, so here's a more network-centric look at the basic test environment that I described a couple slides back. So while it may appear complex, the essential elements are still a simulated or real WAN along with simulated or real applications. So don't forget that when you use a simulated WAN, you can dial down the bandwidth and dial up packet loss, latency, jitter, you know, other possible uh, degradations that could occur on the link during your testing to simulate worst case scenarios. And, and just to, you know, as Bill had noted, the sniff test. Um, I like to underline that. I think that's a great term, by the way, Bill. And, and I think a lot of us, sometimes we feel when we're dealing with very complex technologies that uh, very complex testing needs to be done to, to find out something useful, and, and that's not the case. A lot of times, as Bill says, you can put, you can run things through some very basic um, uh, scenarios, and you can see right away if if something is just not behaving the way you expect it uh, to behave. So, so definitely, I mean, the purpose of discussion today is is to get you to to find out for yourself what's going on with your environment. So while it's always preferable to have applications that closely mirror what you're running in your actual network, you can still typically get very useful results by simply using a basic transaction-oriented application battling for bandwidth, say, against a file-oriented data transfer application. So going back to Bill's analogy, right, the, the, um, the caravan of, uh, of 18 wheelers are your file transfer, and they can certainly, if they fill the entire highway, slow down important traffic. So in general, your goal is to generate more traffic than the link can handle, right? And even just a basic file transfer, transfer uh, protocol program can do that. Then 
use your SD-WAN QoS, your traffic shaping, to allocate bandwidth in accordance with your business objectives. Remember, QoS is a lot more sophisticated than just prioritizing a single stream or a single type of traffic over all others, but you can still find out a lot just by running a few different streams. So note that all of the app scenarios that you develop here can be used in the subsequent QoS scenarios that we will explore in the coming slides. So in the next slide, Bill, we'll dig a little deeper into this topic. Bill, back to you. Kevin, thank you. And uh, the one thing at least here pictorially shown as I go to the next one, um, generally traffic shaping, it's important when you have multiple links. It's also very critical when you might have a blackout or an outage on a, a particular WAN link represented here by the, the red circle, if you will, and all of the branch traffic needs to go through a singular WAN link. And that WAN link, as we talked about for broadband, is going to change in its characteristics. So for a particular scenario, uh, we've made a little animation. There are certainly a lot of different scenarios that can occur that you can test in the lab, but we're going to outline a few of them here. And this graphic that you see is uh, two WAN circuits, and for this case, they're identical. So this is a single WAN connection from the branch to the Internet. And we're running across it a few apps. You've got your real-time VoIP that's shown in the green. And these are like the ambulances, if you will, the very critical cars that you want in the express lane. So you've got some transactional data, customer facing, point of sale, or it you know, might be some sort of a, an inventory lookup app that you're using as you're with folks. Um, and then batch. So this is represented by a Dropbox icon, but it could be email or any bulk transfers that you have. And all the apps fit in very nicely, but as things grow, as Kevin mentioned, you get more traffic than the link can handle what happens is you end up getting congestion. And this can happen either because of more apps on the network or it could also be because the capacity has changed back to the highway like a 12-lane highway that's now going into a seven-lane tunnel. There's a point of uh, congestion, constriction of the available bandwidth, and you get congestion. So on the bottom link where you do not have any traffic shaping this quality of service, you're going to get a poor or a poorer user experience. And what I mean by that is you're going to have uh, certain scenarios of like packet loss, uh, high latency retransmissions. This is where your critical apps are stuck behind those 18 wheelers trying to get through the network. So your audio clips, your POS transaction that was maybe running at three to five seconds is now 12 seconds, 18 seconds, 30 seconds to complete which if you're the employee talking to a customer and waiting for it to go through, uh, just it's an uncomfortable experience. So those are the things that you want to be able to provide this good application assurance. When you have traffic shaping, what it's going to do is dynamically, it should, the, the SD-WAN that you're evaluating, dynamically track things like the available bandwidth. So when you have a constriction in the amount of capacity, you are still providing ample uh, bandwidth to things for like the real-time applications and the transactional data. So with that bandwidth, they're like the express lanes that roll through and then you slow down or it should flow control uh, the bulk transfers. So email may take a little bit longer, but the more important applications go through without issue. So this is a, at least a visual to the traffic shaping, but it doesn't certainly tell the, the whole story as there's more conditions that can occur. And with that, I guess, Kevin, let me hand it back over to you to talk a little bit about path control. All right, Bill, thank you. All right, so we're back to our test environment. So the apps are the same, but now we have two or more links, and we want to be able to evaluate the QoS effectiveness in handling this more complex WAN. So blackout or total link failure, as Bill mentioned a couple slides back, is the easy scenario, as everything must get rerouted. So we are back to single link QoS, just using a different link. So probably more interesting are brownout scenarios. So in such cases, the primary link is up, but gets too busy, too congested, as we saw in Bill's prior uh, slide. Uh, in such cases, based on app priority, certain apps will get migrated to a secondary link. So here in your testing scenarios, you will want to explore what options you have for the SD-WAN system to migrate apps over as well as to migrate apps back again. 
So that's let's just pause here for a second. So, you know, it's always important to have a backup. Sometimes the backup might be a cellular solution, uh, which might be a very very expensive solution. So it's great to have it. Uh, in, in the in the case of either a, a blackout failure or a brownout, uh, to get key applications over, but when that's not necessary anymore, you want to be able to get back again. Otherwise, you could have a very very expensive backup scenario. Okay, so that's certainly something that you want to look at as it as it fails over and then fails back. So. So as broadband links can change, they stay up but have more or less bandwidth and better or worse latency, you really want to create dynamic changes and monitor how the SD-WAN solution responds to these changes, dynamically one hopes. So again, if you're, if you're using a network emulator, in many cases you can simply go in and dial in uh, a bad hair day, if you will, for your for your link. So as Bill and Mike had said previously, the 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 conditions change. Uh, might be decent latency going to high latency, very low packet loss to high packet loss. Well, that happens during the day dynamically. Your SD-WAN solution needs to respond dynamically. You can dial those things into your test environment and get a decent idea of how things might respond in that environment. So let's, uh, let's go to the visuals on this with Bill. You've got some more uh, slides to show us. Bill, I'll turn it back to you. Kevin, thank you. And in this scenario, um, We've got, as Kevin had mentioned, multiple WAN links. So there's a WAN 1 and WAN 2, where you've got, let's say, 10 megabits on the first WAN, 5 megabits on the next WAN. And in WAN 1, I've got my applications I had before, this real-time VoIP, some transactional data, and this bulk batch transfer. But now with path control, you have some uh, application-aware routing. And for reasons, you know, um, maybe for performance, for latency, what have you, you end up routing, let's in this case, some other application, Citrix in this example, to the secondary WAN. So it's an active, active configuration. It's not a primary backup where all traffic's on one and you fail over. In this particular test scenario, you're using both links real time as primary, primary, or active, active. But as we talked about, uh, things happen in life, and in this case, there can be a congestion, and in the test bed, you might tune this into WAN 1, and depending upon the technology and how the SD-WAN uh, works, you know, it may move some critical applications to that secondary path. So what you can see is it may move the voice over, so the voice and the Citrix are now in the secondary WAN, and this is an example without traffic shaping, so your POS may be having some issues, but riding through with the, the bulk transfer, the Dropbox, and then either due to additional applications like additional cars on the highway or uh, the capacity dropping, you may have even further congestion. So it's something where you're not just a little congested, you on the emulator take it and say, you know what, I'm gonna you know, cut the bandwidth by half on my mock circuit and see what happens. The SD-WAN technology may say as part of its path control, we'll move, you know, this other secondary important application, this transaction POS to the second WAN as well. But if you don't have traffic shaping, uh, what you can incur and what you'll get are the packet losses, the retransmissions, the things that give you that poor user experience. And just like uh, Kevin had mentioned, you want to be sensitive to moving things to that secondary WAN. If it is a data plan based a metered connection like LTE, you may not want to move some apps over like a guest Wi-Fi. You may say, uh, move over my POS, move over my VoIP or some critical things, but in the event that I lose my or have a very big degradation on my first WAN, my cable circuit, you know, don't move this traffic over because I don't want to get a large bill at the end. And those are the things within the benchmarking test bed that you build you want to think about and be able to move some apps, block some apps. In the second example here, so this is path control with traffic shaping, we're using the two, and we're showing the two technologies working in concert. So you still have the path control where you've got applications on WAN 1, and you have applications on WAN 2, and now when you hit congestion, and this is depending upon the, you know, the different SD-WAN vendors, it may evaluate it and say, you know what? I've got the path control going on with the application routing, but the congestion is not bad enough for me to move apps to the secondary WAN, 
So I'm going to apply the shape in here to allow the VoIP and the POS transactions to run through with a great end user experience and just slow down the Dropbox apps. And so these are things that you sort of, back to that sniff test, just want to turn the knobs uh, within the lab and just evaluate how the technology works and is it doing what you want it to do. Uh, for example, and Kevin had mentioned, you may move things to WAN 2 and you want to evaluate if that VoIP did move down, you know, how well does it move back to WAN 1 and what kind of time frames and, you know, is there a degradation when that occurs. So this is an example of just path control and traffic shaping working in tandem to improve the end user experience. And with that, Kevin, let me uh, turn it over to you to talk a little bit about replication. Okay, Bill, thank you. All right, so let's, let's look at the testing aspects again. So FEC, as we said, stands for forward error correction and replication. So if you hear those terms, uh, they're effectively the same. So this corrects for WANs that have high packet loss. So the idea is that statistically it is unlikely that two copies of the same packet will get lost in transit from one side to the other. So there, there's more work or more workload here in transmitting, right, because I'll be putting two packets out instead of one, and more bandwidth consumed because I'm sending two packets again instead of one. But applications benefit by avoiding potential hangs or crashes that could result from excessive loss. Okay. So fortunately, you can run this test on a single WAN connection or simulator. Uh, as with all of these things, and as Bill pointed out very nicely in, in his slides, it is best to run most of these before and after, right? So your before shows you what happens without a particular feature and then, or without, in our case, a particular QoS feature, and then your after shows you uh, the benefit that your application gets from having that feature on. So your first or before measurement should be with a normal WAN, no extra packet loss, et cetera, and you can get your throughput, response time, whatever metrics are of interest to you, probably both of those. Then, with FEC off, configure the WAN simulator for high packet loss and measure again. Okay. Then, turn FEC on and run your test yet again. You should be able to compare those results to see actual benefits at the application level, both the throughput and response time of the error correction protocol. Okay, so it's very, very effective, pretty straightforward. Uh, the, the, you know, the cost is a little bit more work, which is not a big deal. The main cost is bandwidth consumption. Uh, so you have to be careful. You just don't want to be using this without, you know, considering the cost, especially as Bill pointed out, if you're using circuits that are metered. You certainly don't want to uh, incur additional costs. And, and these days we're actually now seeing more metering on traditional Internet um, broadband circuits where before it was uh, take as much as you want, there might be a limit, and then after that your monthly costs go up. So be aware of that as well. Bill, back to you. Uh, Kevin, thank you. And just as we go to the next slide, and I think it's a good thing that you stated it well, and just to reiterate it, um, there are a number of different conditions that you could hit and represented here by the green arrows that are showing sort of that replication of what might be the FEC. At times, uh, certain SD-WAN technologies may replicate across multiple WANs, and that would be the case of the two arrows shown. Uh, some might, as Kevin pointed out, replicate on the same WAN. So when you hit the brown outs, you start increasing the FEC to improve the chance of it getting across to the other side. For the animation uh, that I'm going to show is an initial replication where it's replicating across the two WANs. And as Kevin had mentioned about the metered connections and being usage sensitive, you would typically say what is most important to you, you know, to your users, uh, what's most critical. Uh, VoIP is the example that's shown here. It might be uh, credit card transactions. It might be some sort of a monitoring. Uh, if you're, for those that are, you know, old school with a, a SCADA thing that you're monitoring a very specific component and you need to be able to get, you know, that telemetry back you typically would do those just critical things, but you wouldn't say try to replicate or do FEC on things like uh, guest Wi-Fi. You know, it's uh, kind of understood, and if the end user doesn't get uh, an exceptional experience on an amenity uh, service like that, that would be fine. So you want to be sensitive to the applications and what you replicate or put the FEC on. This is an example where all three of those quality of services are running together. So you've got the traffic shaping, we've got 
applications that are using a, two WANs into the branch location, WAN 1 and WAN 2. I am path control and sort of steering, you know, things into each, and then I'm replicating what would be, a, let's say, a VoIP call, this real-time traffic. And you as a user may choose to do this because voice is very important to you. And certain SD-WAN technologies handle this differently. Sometimes uh, they'll run it on a particular one WAN, and when you have congestion or a brownout, it'll move the call over. Other technologies may say you want a near hitless experience. Again, a voice is key and critical to my employees and interacting with my customers. I just I want that application assurance, like when I turn the lights on, the call just goes through, I get dial tone, there's no issues, you know, I'm focusing on the customer, not worried about the network. That's this case where you're replicating it across the two WANs, so you're burning a little bit of extra bandwidth, but it gives you a higher assurance that it reaches the other side. So when you hit congestion and um, these variances within the broadband, you are doing the traffic shaping to still make sure that you get a consistent user experience for things like the voice. Uh, your critical traffic, your apps are going through, and then your batch transactions, these emails, the Dropbox, those are the things that end up getting slowed down uh, just because they're less important, maybe not customer facing. And what I wanna do is be able to now show you folks a bit of data. So this is a, what I'm gonna share with here is a case study that uses all three of these in this animation in a slightly different format. So what you're seeing in front of you is some customer data that they gave back to us. So this is a 1600 site broadband network. And into each of the branch locations are two different types of broadband, meaning uh, cable and fiber or fiber and DSL, maybe cable and LTE. So it's a completely broadband network, 1600 locations. And uh, these folks do a lot of, it's a financial institution, they do a lot of financial planning. Um, during a five-day business week, they're open Monday through Friday, they'll handle roughly 2.4 million calls in a week. So they rely very, very heavily upon voice and certainly want a good user experience when they're calling and talking to clients. What you see on here is a depiction of something called a MOS score, M-O-S, and it's a calculation, if you will, of the end user experience of a VoIP call. So it looks at the voice packets and the jitter, the latency, you know, network characteristics of it. At the end, there's a calculation that says, on average, here's what the user experienced, and that's represented by these faces on the side to the right, a very unhappy experience at the bottom all the way to an exceptional experience above. And from a MOS score perspective, uh, like your credit score or your bank account, a higher number is better, so you want a high MOS score. The first panel shows the range in these vertical white bars of the MOS score for the branches in a given day. So you can see there are multiple days there across the 1600 site network, and without any sort of QoS, just straight broadband, uh, you can see that the MOS varies widely from an exceptionally poor call quality, where you might have had clipping, you might have had uh, you know, degradation, sounded like they were talking in a tin can, you couldn't quite hear what they were saying, it was garbled, up to where it was maybe an okay experience because you didn't have a lot of other competing applications for that specific call. And when you introduce into this environment, this broadband environment, traffic shaping, that's the next panel. And this is traffic shaping on a single broadband. So we're not to SD-WAN with active-active yet, this is just SD-WAN with that quality of service where it's saying, let me identify, classify, you know, and prioritize this critical application that's VoIP. And with the traffic shaping, you can see a remarkable improvement in the day-to-day -day MOS score, where now instead of it being from a very poor and you know, unacceptable level, it gets up into where it's generally okay, sometimes touching on a really good call. And um, when you add in, in the third pane, a secondary path, so this is a dual broadband connection, and they ended up doing path control to mitigate brownouts as well as doing replication. So they are an example of where they took their VoIP traffic specifically and said, I want a, a hitless experience. 
So if there is a degradation, I don't want to take the time or the impact to move it to the secondary WAN, you know, and risk someone hearing garbled speech or not being clear. I just want to be a great call. They replicate on both WAN links. And same network, same sites, same third-party VoIP provider, you can see again a dramatic improvement in the tightness of the MOS scoring where it is now what people would normally say is a near toll quality. It would be like picking up a landline, getting a dial tone, using it, and hanging up. And so this is how SD-WAN, certainly you can see how it's working in this you know, production network, uh, is a benefit when you combine all of these QoS technologies. Uh, this quality of service is a lot like uh, a saw. You know, you've got band saws, you've got um, circular saws, you've got all these different types of cutting saws, but you use them in different instances for different types of projects. This QoS is very same as broadband changes in brownouts, blackouts, capacity, jitter, latency. These different uh, quality of service techniques work in concert to end up giving you a great user experience and gives the business just a, an overall application assurance. You just pick up the phone and it works, if you will. I guess with that, uh, Kevin, let me go ahead and hand it back over to you just to give us some of the key takeaways and summarize. Sure, Bill. Thanks, and p feel free to uh, join in on the slide as well before we get to the Q and A. So, yeah, I mean, it's you, you certainly see it was great that you have that example there where you can see it in the real world with a with a large. Uh, um, you know, client base or location base, and that MOS score, the MOS score, the you know, the voice quality is is always a very, very good one because it, the um, you know, voice is very, very sensitive. It's not just the loss; it's latency as well. So, if you have good MOS, you know, things are uh, things are good. So, I think it's a very, very good example. So, thanks for sharing that. So, let, let's look at what we have here. So. We're talking probably on every slide we said the word or implied uh, congestion, uh, and you might be thinking, well, maybe that's not an issue. I think it's safe to say that whoever you are and whatever your network is, congestion is a problem that you will have. So, you know, Bill had mentioned about the applications growing exponentially. Certainly demand is growing. Uh, you put the bandwidth there and there'll be some application that will consume it. It doesn't take lots of applications. A couple streaming applications can consume huge amounts of data. So, um, I think it's very, very safe to assume that you will have congestion and you need to have a solution for that. So, it's a problem you want to solve. So there's lots of SD-WAN solutions out there. So while every SD-WAN solution you look at will appear to be, or some might claim to be, a panacea, like anything else, they are not all the same. The underlying technology is different. The underlying architecture is going to be different. So the only way that you can be sure what works for you is to benchmark it. And what's interesting is I've been looking at and working with technology for some decades now, and what I'm seeing today is there's actually less uh, detail available than there were years ago. A lot of the, the vendors want you to buy on brand. They don't want to really tell you specifically what they're going to do and how it's going to work. That might be good for them, but it might not be good for you. You really need to prove it to yourself. So benchmark these three key areas of QoS, dynamic traffic shaping, path control, and forward error correction. See what you can do about configuring the WAN. What kind of options will you have? So during this process, you'll have a chance to look at the GUI. You'll get to see the type of flexibility you have with configuring the environment. You'll get to see the kind of analytics you have. Run some programs through it. See if it can detect um, specific programs or if it just lumps everything into a few categories. Very, very important. As Bill pointed out, the path costs, right? Uh, control is important, but you need to be able to control not just the path, but the cost of the path. So you need to be able to see what you can do as far as recovery when you fall, fail over to metered environments. Okay? Uh, FEC, there's a lot of subtleties to forward error correction. Is it sending the packets out on one link? Is it sending it out on both links? So there's differences there in, in what the cost will be for the bandwidth. There's differences there in terms of what the effectiveness might be for the application. So use our Tolly SD-WAN Benchmarking Best Practices Guide. It is a vendor-neutral guide to help you. You can find out a lot just by setting up a very basic test environment for your proof-of-concept work. So be sure to do it. 
So let's go to the Q&A. Mike, back to you. Bill and Kevin, thank you very much. That was very, very helpful. I appreciate that very much. I need to apologize to the group. We seem to be having a little bit of a challenge with our text uh, text chat window there. So I have a few questions that have been emailed to me. And in the meanwhile, if you have a question we don't get to, uh, we'll either call it or just have you open your mic and ask that, or you can email it in to us there afterwards and we'll get back to you. Bill, the first question I think is probably targeted towards you, uh, but Kevin, feel free to, to, uh, to, to chime in. Given the variability of broadband links, as you discussed, and in the internet in general, do you still need a QoS solution if you're bringing in, you know, cable or fiber pipes that are 50 and maybe as much as 100 megabits? Uh, yeah, Mike, thank, thank you for that question, whoever submitted it. Um, my answer would be yes, as, you know, Kevin pointed out, and I think of my, uh, my kids, um, it doesn't take much in today's environment to add applications to just fill a 50 meg, 100 meg or more link. And those can be things as you try to maybe offer guest Wi-Fi as you're moving towards maybe a training solution, you know, that's more uh, feature rich with video and, um, you know, opening up the internet for different uh, loyalty apps and such. Even if you get more bandwidth, the applications in general sort of a build it and they will come. Yeah, they're, they're probably already there and just waiting. As soon as you have that bandwidth, it gets consumed. And the second point I'd raise is even with a 50 meg or 100 meg broadband link, there, there will be times that you have that bad hair day, that it's a rainy day, that uh, for whatever reason, you know, it drops to less than you expect. And you're definitely going to need QoS then to give you that app assurance and protect those critical apps. Yep, and, and this is Kevin. So I, I agree with what Bill said. And I think the key word there, Mike, is assurance. So if you have what today would be considered a high bandwidth pipe, you'd probably be okay until until some point in the future, right? And as Bill pointed out, that point in the future will probably arrive sooner than we would guess. And again, it's all about assurance. So uh, with QoS, you can assure that if the situation changes, if something happens, if the the network bad hair day happens, if some application happens to have a 10 gig server connection and starts flooding out, uh, that you'll be able to handle it. So, I, I think when we're talking, you know, enterprise, we're talking, you know, but point of sale and, and enterprise what these are important business applications. So, you don't want to trust it to luck or hope. You 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 want to assure it, and the only way to assure it is QoS. Thank you. Well, I'm excited that here on our webinar today, we've potentially introduced a new way of measuring performance on networks, and that is good hair and bad hair. <laughs> uh, Kevin, yes. Kevin I'd, I'd like to address this next question uh, to you, because as the author of that uh, best practices benchmarking guide and everything, there's a question here. It, it, the question is this. The technology does look a little complex. How practical is it really? to set up an in-house test environment. So yeah, it, it, it's uh, the, the technology is is complex, though that's different from being complicated, right? And I'll ask Bill to comment on this uh, when, when I finish. Um, it, it's, it's complex in that it's got to do complex things. Um, you can get, you know, do some very useful testing by having, you know, one oldish PC that you that you set aside and and download a um, an open source network emulator on, and you know two or a few PCs that you use to be the ends with the applications that go across the uh, the SD WAN. So uh, it is doable, and once you so you don't have to spend a lot of money. It takes a little bit of time, uh, and there are some excellent commercial products out there too. But I'm assuming that you're trying to do it on a you know on whatever budget you might have. But yes, you can do it, and 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 it gives you a chance to see how uh, complicated the complex products should be because at the end of the day, you know, we didn't really talk about operational complexity, but when you look at total cost of ownership, uh, you want a product that you know, does good things, but also that is fairly easy to use and doesn't need you know, vast amounts of training. So you will at least get to see that. You'll have to encounter that when you set up your environment. Bill, thoughts on that same topic? 
Yeah, just in the, the margins of my post-it note here, I was writing management and operation, exactly that. Uh, we didn't discuss it, but, um, you know, the, the complexity, you, you can make it very, very complex, but I think there's a, if you follow that, uh, keep it simple rule, the KISS process, you know, a process, I think you can set something up, a few quick apps, and it's much like test driving a car. It's either going to be fitting what you want and you're going to get that initial impression or uh, it's, you know, you're going to keep looking because it's not meeting that need. And the evaluation of the SD-WAN, and this is more so if you're a do-it-yourself, a DIY shop, you do want to look at, they are very complex QoS, you know, techniques, but it shouldn't be that complex to run the network because then your total return on investment, your ROI is going to be down because it's saving you a little bit on the bandwidth, but if you have to hire two new people to manage this technology, then it's, it's not a great fit. So, yeah, that the benchmarking and the setting up of it in the lab, just the, the general operational complexity should come into bear and just be something that you're able to evaluate quickly. Kevin, I'm going to take advantage of my role as moderator and kind of ask a follow-up question on that one. Now, your best benchmarking best practices document is vendor neutral so far as SD-WAN providers are concerned. Do you happen to either in the document or just in general have a recommendation on commercial test tools? If I wanted to, you know, purchase some things and, and have that in my lab, do you, do you have any experience with the recommendations there? Yeah, I mean, uh, we have a lot of experience. Um, you know, we're we're vendor neutral all the way around, so we try to avoid recommendations unless we know exactly what someone's using something for. But you know, there's companies, uh, Ixia Networks, which is now part of Keysight. Um, you know, has network emulators, has application emulators. Uh, Xena Networks, uh, which is a relatively new-ish player, has layer two to three, layer four to seven. Emulators, very, very powerful products, Spirant Communications as well. Um, Apposite Technologies, and I've got some of these names in the document, has um, some network emulators that are very sophisticated. So there, there's products out there that you, that you can get. Uh, and, and so you know, whatever you need to do, uh, you can do. And a lot of these vendors will offer tiered products. So if you want to get started with a, you know, a, a smaller type of environment, you can get like a Xena has a compact with, I forget, half a dozen ports or so. And if you really need to be you know, scaling up large, you can do that as well. So either way, you know, there, there's options both ways. Uh, the commercial ones obviously have support. They uh, typically have much more sophisticated capabilities, but you know they're not free. They're commercial. So you might want to at least you know start and get your feet wet with some of the uh, open source options that are there. To, to if nothing else, to find out what your needs are. So then when you look at commercially available tools, you can ask better questions and and get the ones that suit your needs. I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, sure. we're starting to get close to the end of our prepared time, so I'm going to grab one last question here. Um, and I'll, and I'll address it to both of you. Maybe, Bill, you take the first stab at it, and then, Kevin, if you want to follow on. When you are looking at uh, preparing that application assurance and that overall network there, which branch-level transports pair best together? Maybe I'm trying to have a little bit of a of path diversity, or maybe I'm, you know, shopping around and going to have, uh, you know, cable and something else. But... Are there are there good are, are there recommended pairs? I guess is where the question is trying to go. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. And yes, and part of it depends upon your specific implementation. Um, I would certainly, and Mike, you pointed out, uh, if you're bringing in multiple broadband links, I would uh, diversify as far as the providers. So you wouldn't use the same provider. Uh, everywhere on both WAN links, so if that provider had an issue, some sort of, let's say, a nationwide problem and it affected their routing, you know, you don't want both of your WAN circuits to go down. Um, for that example that I showed with the 1,600 locations, uh, underneath, I want to say they had ballpark at about 100 network access providers, 100 different ISPs that helped underlay and was the foundation for those 1,600 sites. You might have one person for cable, the other person for, you know, a DSL. 
From a transport perspective, uh, typically it's across the board, but we do see a nice pairing of people that uh, cable tends to give you fairly good availability and uh, bandwidth for the price. So people like cable as a typical wireline, and then they'll just very quickly back it up with some sort of an LTE from one of the cellular providers. So it would be a cable and LTE pairing. And when you do that, just for the speeds, and then you like it because the LTE is just a diverse transport, it isn't, you know, using the same wire into the building. So in case something happens with a backhoe, you know, you still have connectivity, you do need to, and we talked about in the SD-WAN technology, evaluating uh, a metered connection that you're using it smartly and wisely for the applications that you're path controlling over or um, traffic shaping on. I guess, Kevin, do you have anything else to add there? Uh, Bill, I mean, just, just to underline some of the things that you said about the provider diversification or diversity is, is key, right? I mean, for the very reasons you say. Um, you know, if you have just one cable going into the building and that gets uh, that gets cut by a backhoe, you're in trouble. So um, it, it kind of at the higher level, that's like if you have wired and wireless, that's great because they can't cut wireless, right? So you won't have that issue as well. And if there's some major outage on the wireless, you still have the wired, and that gets to your last point, Bill, about um, I think we've said it a lot of times for good reason today, which is to look at it being you know, the awareness of metered connections. And as it relates to your SD-WAN solution, make sure that your SD-WAN solution has awareness of uh, metered connections and relative costs so that in addition to providing your users with the best quality of service, it provides your company with the, the, uh, you know, the best financial model um, you know, for using that bandwidth. So basically concur with everything you say. Mike? Fantastic. Gentlemen, um, I would like to personally thank both of you for taking the time to be with us here today. Uh, we've been very fortunate. We've had an international audience with some participants from all over the United States, as well as some participants from Latin, and, Latin America and South America. So we're very, very excited to have had the opportunity to address this important topic. Um, again, this has been recorded, will be available on the Hughes website uh, early next week. And if you would like to get more information uh, specific to this topic, please go to business.hughes.com slash application dash assurance. Again, that's business.hughes.com slash application assurance. My name is Mike Tippett, and it has been my pleasure to moderate, and I appreciate you being here. Thank you, and have a great week.